Welcome to this episode of Talk is Biotech, Jennifer. Great to have you. Thanks for having me. Really happy to be here. Awesome. Do you want to start with a quick introduction? Tell us a little bit about you. Absolutely. Hi, I'm Jennifer Kuti. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Better Milk based in Montreal, Canada. We are a cell-based milk company that makes milk with mammary cells. So basically what we do is take cells from inside of the cow udder and then we bring them back to our lab where then they are introduced in a bioreactor, uh, given vitamins, minerals, amino acids, and some hormones. And then they lactate just like it would in a natural cow, um, except it's better for the environment. It has less resources. And also it is better for the animal since we don't have to actually grow the cow from scratch. I love it. I like how you said to grow the cow from scratch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to know more about your story. How did you end up here? Like, What is your background? What was the role of your upbringing and background to start Absolutely. this company? So I have a mostly psychology background. I also take some business classes right now part-time to help me build this company. And the reason why I started this company is because I am a vegan and I've been animal-free for six to seven years, I would say. And my alimentation and trying to avoid animal products has been really a core um, value for me. And it has shaped me into the person that I am today. And when I met my co-founder, who's actually my life partner as well, we shared the same values for the animals. He was vegan as well. And when you're vegan, it's really hard to find good dairy products. So when we actually researched to see it, dairy products that tasted more like milk or less plant-based, and we found the company Perfect Day in the United States who make... Um, animal cow proteins using recombinant production and that's the route we actually wanted to go at first uh, we wanted to take a yeast and genetically engineer it to produce one or two specific proteins of milk but then we had a lot of discussions and we actually realized that we wanted to produce whole milk and not just a few of the proteins so then we started looking at how we could make whole milk without having a cow and we found that you could use mammary cells from the, the cow. So grow some cells from the cow inside of your lab and make it produce milk that is similar um, in functionality and hopefully in taste as traditional milk. Love it. I'm going to take a few steps back to talk about the journey. How did you reach at the current state as a business? Like what were the challenges, what you had to do, like when you have to start a company? I also started last year. You have to worry about what product you will be creating or service yeah. depends on the yeah, business model. Uh, mm -hmm. How will you form a team? Will you raise money? So there are like different stepping stones. Do you want to talk about your journey and also some of the challenges you faced along the way? Absolutely. So the first, I would say, challenge was actually getting to do it. We're looking at each other and saying, do we really want to build a company? Are we there in our life? And then we just said, Let's go, let's do it. So we did a lot of literature search. We contacted a lot of people in the research field because we were both not from biotech backgrounds. So we spoke to a lot of dairy experts, geneticists, biologists, everything to figure out what we're going to do. And then we started um, contacting universities to see if some students could carry out our research to have some preliminary data to conduct our experiments. And that's how we got started. We found someone at the University of Toronto who could um, do the research for us. And that started as a research project. We had to get a little bit funding. So we used this data to get funding from Sustainable Food Ventures, which are a big um, investor fund in the United States. They were our first investors and that really helped us to get um, started. So that, that money helped us for the prototype and to actually hire more people. We are now five in the team, three biomedical engineers and biologists are helping us build this technology. It's not just me and my co-founder anymore. It's been a great journey. Great. And so technological challenge is always there. It takes time, especially yeah. in, in, in the bio world. What are the challenges you faced uh, while creating this company? Yes, um, so far there's a lot of um, unexpected challenges like, um, like contamination in your cells or even just the supply chain, getting your 
your your reagents and your consumables in time for your experiments. Um, with COVID, especially, it's been quite hard to make sure that your supplies arrive on time. Um, and in terms of actually planning an experiment in your head and planning how it will go, and then actually doing it, and so many things happen that you can't control and that you don't end up having the end result of happening a lot. But I would say that these in, in those times, these experiments often bring us um, data that we wouldn't have expected. So I think there is like a balance. Sometimes the challenges are tough, but they bring unexpected results that can help us bring the company forward. Right. I think biology is so unpredictable. You cannot yes, be sure like that's going to work. What will be the result? Yes. Great. So, so I think it's a great segue to uh, double click on your technology, like a key uh, innovation you have here to produce milk uh, without uh, even uh, growing animal from scratch. So I would, uh, I would love to double click on your technology. Like what is it? You obtain a mammalian cells, cell lines, do you genetically modify them to increase uh, production or I don't know, to improve taste? Like what exactly you do or doing uh, fortified with higher protein or so I'd love to know your thinking while planning these experiments. Yes. Um, so we're using an immortalized bovine cell line, which means that these cells can live on forever. We never need to go back to the cow to result to record more cells. We already have it in the lab. Um, and what to do? Yes, we use a little bit of genetic engineering for a couple of reasons. The main ones being um, to increase the milk production and to sustain the milk production because um, sometimes these cells, they lactate for, let's say, a week and then it decreases over time. And we're using genetic engineering to make sure that that doesn't happen, to make sure that we have a lot of milk over a long period of time. And we also use some genetic engineering to decrease the cost of production because in this technology, the cost of producing milk can be quite expensive. You have to purchase a lot of food for the cells. So an important part of our technology is really to try to reduce all of these costs as much as possible. Right, so cell lines are ready and then you yeah. have to do the fermentation, like how exactly it works. Yes, and so once the cell, the cell line is ready, you put it in a bioreactor, which is like a kind of a replication of the body, human or cow, um, and then you adjust some the temperature and you give continued flow of medium so that the cells get feed and they also have the hormones to lactate and the hormone is really the key part to make these cells lactate because you can grow them forever and without having them lactate but once you induce lactation with that specific hormone then it's like opening a faucet and the milk flows of course it's not as much as a faucet, but it's still kind of magical how these cells react to hormones. And then we harvest the milk, then we do some testing to see the components. So to make sure that the ratio between the fats or the sugars or the proteins is similar as in milk. And then our upcoming test will be for taste and functionality, as you mentioned. I love it. And how much of the work goes to downstream work, like purification and extracting the right product? A good question. Not that much at the moment. We haven't had enough milk to do a lot of downstream processing, but this downstream processing is limited because of the design of our bioreactor. This allows really to make sure that the milk is secreted in a separate chamber that um, it is from the feed. So once the milk is produced in that separate chamber, you can just harvest it, and then do your testing on it. There's, of course, there will be more purification when it comes to getting it food grade. But for now, no need for purification to see the proteins or to make sure that it's not contaminated with medium. Right. What is your goal to improve the taste of uh, real milk or to enrich it with additional uh, nutritional value? Do you have any plans there too? Yeah, the goal is really to have a versatile technology uh, we want to to be able to include it in as many products as possible because, as you know, the dairy industry is almost a trillion dollar industry worldwide, and there's so many different products that include milk. Not only the food products that we know, like dairy or cheese or yogurt. There's also um, a lot of cosmetic products that have milk, like lotions. There's also pharmaceutical products that have milk, and this is really all the markets are targeting. Um, and another advantage of our technology is, of course, the sustainability and the ethical part. 
Um, we don't have to grow cows from scratch. We have um, we don't have to have the crops. We don't have to use as much water. There's so many advantages to to this technology when it comes to the environment. Um, yeah. Do you have any uh, claims, any patent uh, pending or approved? Yes, we have a patent pending technology for all of our cell line, and it's. It is pretty impressive. Like the whole biology is becoming more engineering like. So you're not dependent on these like biological organisms, what exactly they are producing. You understand how their body works and then just leverage some part of the machinery, right? Instead of using the whole machinery, which is a cow in this case, you realize. Yeah, yeah, it's like in in the essay by Winston Churchill, who predicted that cell agriculture would exist one day that we wouldn't have to grow the chicken, but only the part of the chicken that we want to consume and, and have. Right. And because these biological machineries are pretty evolved, the billions of years of evolutionary forces behind exactly. them, right? Yeah. But we need more efficient way, more ethical way, more sustainable ways to take advantage of that because using the whole cow just for the sake of producing milk is just so outdated. So I, yeah. I love what you're doing smartly. Thank yeah, you. Learn, learn how memory cells work. That's what I say, memory cells? Memory cells, yes. Yeah, memory cells works. Understand them and leverage them, put them uh, to the right use with a common goal. Love it. And I think we already touched some of the advantages of producing milk uh, animal-free. So my question is, why do we have to take animals out of milk? There are many obvious reasons, but... When you think about the impact of the company in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, like like what is your, why it is even important to taking animals out of the whole process? Yeah, um, it is important because the planet is dying at the moment. Uh, we don't have enough resources to feed the entire planet. Um, the, the animal um, industry, at, not just for milk, but for, for um, also meats and fish, they take so much of the planet's resources in terms of water. They take, they do deforestation. Uh, they contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. There's so many things that contribute to the decline of the planet's health. And if we can um, have the same end product that these animals give us and have been giving us for centuries now, without all of these bad um, effects that caused by the animal industry, then I think we'll end up winning because if my children, for instance, want to live for 100 years on this planet, they need to have a sustainable food system. And right now we don't have a sustainable food system that can last us for the centuries to come. So you don't think we can have enough cows, reproduce enough cows to produce uh, enough milk for the next few decades and century? I'm playing devil's advocate here, right? So yeah, yeah. I'm also vegan, but I, I want to think from the perspective of uh, other uh, people, like they will be like, we can produce milk as much as we want. So why not just uh, following the status quo? Because the status quo right now is, not sustainable. For traditional milk, there's, yeah. yeah, of course, manufacturers of dairy and of meat are optimized and have been optimized for years now. But one day we'll not have enough resources to continue feeding this industry. Yes, of course, we can grow cows, but at some point, these cows won't have enough water to drink or they won't have enough food to eat because the crops, we don't have space to grow them or there's fires because there's too much deforestation. I think we're at this point in time where we really have to find an alternative to the foods that we enjoy because obviously there's a lot of plant-based alternatives currently on the market that have been there for a few decades now. And the reason why it's not growing as fast as we would like it to is because of the taste. There's a lot of people who quit eating animals go vegetarian because they understand that this supply chain is not sustainable and they do it also for the animals because they care that they won't switch to a vegan diet because the taste of dairy is too important for them it provides them comfort provides them happiness and at this moment these plant-based alternatives don't offer them that and this is the reason why we are replicating the traditional milk to offer them the products with the same taste and same functionality that they are looking for when they go to the grocery store. 
but without all of these nefast consequences the traditional industry has on the planet and on animals. I, I agree with you. I like how you put it because it's not just about supporting or leveraging enough number of cows to produce milk. They are also sharing resources on this planet, right? We have already 7 billion humans, a population also growing super fast. And yes. a growing animal is an expensive business, right? And there's so much carbon footprint that they leave uh, with them. So it's just, it's not a, a smarter way in the 20th, 21st century. So I, I do understand exactly. that part. And the I'm technology very... has been there for years. I mean, we've been producing recombinant right. proteins for insulin for 30 years right. now. And I think it's just time to take that technology and really put it as available as possible for consumers. and really start the cellular revolution. Yeah, that's right. And I think the, the only current challenge, which is just for a period of time, is the scalability of producing milk using these cell lines, because as you said, it's expensive, but I yeah. think it will take a couple of years to optimize the process. But once you optimize it, then uh, it becomes pretty scalable too. Exactly. Just like traditional dairy and meat was probably not um, super, it was expensive at first, I assume, and has been growing for centuries now and has been getting more and more efficient. Yeah, you, you talked about the taste of plant-based uh, milk. Do you want to talk about it? Like why cannot we improve? For example, for vegan meat, what they're doing is they even genetically engineer microbial strain with heme protein, the hemoglobin. Yeah. So it gives them more like a similar uh, taste sensation. So do you think that cannot be done to the milk industry leveraging microbes to improve the taste uh, and instead of uh, relying completely on cell lines that will take a few years uh, to become really scalable? That's a good question. Definitely, yes, we can use uh, yeast or microbes to produce some components of milk to improve taste um, by making adding to plant-based product for instance but i don't think you will ever have that complete mouthfeel and functionality of traditional milk because you're not growing you're not producing the whole thing when you produce milk it from cells or from an animal or for a human all of the components um, are secreted as, at the same time and all of these components act together to function in a certain way and to taste in a certain way and all of them working together gives you that taste and that feel that you're you, that you recognize when you drink milk or when you eat ice cream and when you only produce some components of that milk for instance one protein you don't get the full functional profile of that whole milk so i think it's definitely a way forward to produce some proteins with precision fermentation but i think in the long run once it's optimized I, whole milk is going to be um, better in the end if you want a product that is exactly the same as traditional milk or traditional dairy. So how the future dairy will look like? So if I go to dairy, do you think we will have tens of thousands of big uh, bioreactors? Yeah, I think that could be definitely done. A cow is quite big. I don't know if you've ever seen a cow in real life, but they're ginormous. <laughs> you don't really expect it um, to be that big. So when it comes to making a bioreactor that has the same number of cells that would be inside of the cow udder, it comes out as smaller than a cow. So you could think it maybe as like a small farm of bioreactors <laughs> um, that would need much less space because they can be all stacked together without um, worrying about ethics. And also they can be stacked on each other to make it smaller. If you think about the amount of space that the resources required to feed and to uh, provide for the animals take on the planet at a global level, if you reduce that and you only replace it with factories of cell-based milk, for instance, it takes way much less way much less space yeah when you were saying i'm not sure if you have seen cow in real life i was thinking i grew up in <laughs> india i used to see cows on the street oh and... wow <laughs> impressive <laughs> but yeah i think fermenters can be pretty small too but if you have to compare number of fermenters with number of cows to produce milk and like how much time uh, it takes so the difference in the size a quantity it produces, and the time it takes if you have to compare both of these uh, machineries. Yes, 
Um, so inside, the, uh, if we take the cow, for example, the cow normally produces about 35 to 40 liters of milk per day in only one cow. Um, and the cells that are actively producing milk inside of the cow udder is approximately 1.5 trillion cells. So 1.5 trillion cells all working together to produce 35 to 40 liters of milk per day. And then you try to translate that into a bioreactor in a number of cells. For now, in our bioreactor, we can only hold a few million cells, so not close to the trillion. And it, in terms of production, it doesn't compare to the cow for now. But eventually, what we aim to do is to optimize our cell lines so that they're able to produce more than the cells inside of the cow to have less than 1.5 trillion and grow them inside of our bioreactors. In terms of time to grow these cells, normally you need approximately eight to 10 days to grow them to a certain number for the millions. That's about maybe eight to 10 days. For trillions, it would take maybe two weeks to grow that. But when it comes to making milk, once you have grown these cells to the level of constituency that you need, you don't need to do it again. They can produce milk for the period of time you wish them to. And then you produce milk on a continuous basis. And there you have it. It's not like, like um, in cell-based meat, for instance, where you have to grow your cells continuously, but then some get eaten because okay. you consume the cells. And then you have to grow some more. And then it's like a continuous process. But for us, we really keep the same cell lines and grow them like like tiny little cows. Love it. So you said 1.5 trillion, I don't know, one cow probably has 5 trillion cells, if not more. And But, but yeah, currently uh, these cells are outside cow body, so it will take some time to optimize the environmental condition. Yeah. And because you're basically, your competitor is more like nature forces, right? <laughs> so you're using it for different purpose. So it's like playing God, that's pretty fun. Yeah. And then you have to uh, Humble make these... God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then you have goal to make these uh, cells or cell lines more superior uh, because you can basically uh, genetically modify them and uh, enrich their genome to produce yeah. better quality product. So it, it does make sense to put that kind of work to produce a superior product and hopefully uh, more efficient uh, machinery than a natural yeah, like absolutely animal. and you make me think that it's more efficient also in terms of um like milk allergies for instance because because of the genetic engineering you can modify the components of milk before it's even produced so you don't need downstream processing to separate lactose for instance you can tell your cell line don't produce lactose and then it will make milk without lactose which is a huge advantage i think for the dairy industry and for food products because you can manipulate what is inside of your milk if you want a milk that has more casein to have a more stringy cheese for instance that could be done and if you want to genetically engineer the cell line to um, remove some i don't know fats or cholesterol or sugars that can also be done there's a endless possibilities yes like designer milk right so you yeah. can <laughs> design it that suits your need the best so basically customization offering. So we are not dependent on what cow is producing and then yes. worry about extracting lactose and replacing it with other sugar alternative. It's uh, basically at the uh, manufacturing level, you can manufacture it, not at the processing level. Because it's a very specialized industry. You talked about challenges. If someone want to start biology business, how important is it to have biology background? I would say it's important if you're doing everything yourself. I think you definitely need a lot of knowledge to run a biotech company. But I would say that when you're familiar with the technology and you have the knowledge to hire someone with the um, skills that you're missing, that can be done also. So you don't necessarily need to be a technical founder to have a biotech company. I think I'm the living proof of that. I don't have a background in biology or science, but I do understand pretty much everything that goes on in my company. I've read a lot of literature and I'm aware of everything that goes on, but I will not be the one performing the experiments because there would not be a company <laughs> to run. I'm really grateful for my employees. I think they're doing an amazing job in the lab working on these cell lines. 
and I would not be there without them. And I think it's really important to have that collaboration with the people that have skills that you don't. It's really amazing for a couple of reasons. One is I think biology is really one of the fastest growing industry. They say 60% of physical goods can be manufactured biologically in the next decade or two. And biomanufacturing alone is going to be a $2 trillion industry. So it has to be democratized, right? We cannot have every bio founder as biologists or molecular biologists. So we need more people in the mainstream, just like what happened in the IT world, right? So they democratized it. Everyone, I use computer. I don't understand the programming behind most of the things I do. So I think the biological revolution is on the horizon. And, I agree. Uh, yeah. And in... As a founder, I think you have to not be scared of hiring people who are smarter than you and who know more than you, because that's that's how it should be. I mean, it's not because you don't have a PhD in experimental medicine that you can't do it. You just have to get out there and learn what you have to learn and understand that not everybody is born knowing everything and you have to really work hard and have a vision for what you're doing. But yes, I I totally agree that biology and the business world and biotech needs to be democratized. Yeah. And what you said really resonated with me as a founder. You look for people smarter than you, because if you're insecure, you cannot really do uh, amazing things. You need people to do great work. So you have to empower people who are smarter than you, maybe Uh, You have your own domain of strength in one field, but different people have complementary skills. So when I started a company, this is one of the first things I I, I learned that you need smarter people. Okay, you are excited, you're visionary, you want to do 10 different things, but you cannot do really anything without the help of people with different uh, needs. Starting a business requires so many different things. Yes. And if you want to be optimal, you have to work on the thing that you do best and let other people do the things that they do best. That's right. And to to change gears a little bit. So what you're doing makes sense. Ethically, it makes sense. And so I want to understand more economical side of things. Right. So what creative business models you are exploring or you would explore in the near future? So because you are currently in the uh, very early stages where you are still optimizing processes, you have some some proof that it is going to work. And when it comes to uh, scalability, what are these stages? I would love to understand a little bit more. So you have early product and now you have to make it scalable. So you are optimizing processes Then you will have biomanufacturing uh, stage and maybe downstream processing of it. So what type of business model you are exploring at each stages? Yes. So there's a lot of different steps. Right now we're working on kind of the in-between between prototype and pilot scale, I would say. So in terms of the steps, you have to make sure that you're able to produce the quantity that would be required to sell. You also have to worry about regulation because it is a novel product. It doesn't exist yet. So we have to work with uh, the regulation agencies to make sure that our product is suitable for consumption. And once we pass that test and once our cells are able to produce the quantity that we need them to, then we can think about how it works in terms of processing and in terms of functionality and what we can do with that product. Our business model is to sell to other companies. So we want to be a B2B company that sells our whole milk to companies that use that milk inside of their products. That can be food products, that can be cosmetics, and that can be pharmaceutical products. We are not limited to any market. Um, We are going to sell our milk in a powdered form to facilitate the shipping and to make sure that it's more easily um, stored. You talked about regulation. So it's not B2C, it's B2B. What do they care? Even to call it a milk, because I know there was a huge fight in the plant-based milk products and a traditional milk producer, they were like, this is not even a milk because of nutritional value or because of taste. So if we just focus on regulation, whether it's FDA or um, other regulatory agencies, like what things they look for, it is just safety or it is also the nutritional profile. There's a lot of different things that are um, observed by these companies, by these uh, regulatory bodies. Um, The safety is definitely the most 
prominent part. Of course, you don't want to sell a product that is not suitable for consumption. They also look at how you produce your milk. So all of the equipment that goes into it, all of the medium, all of the the, the facilities, are they, are, are they um, good for, for production to make sure there's no contamination? Um, they also look at, uh, yes, the nutritional, the nutritional profile. At the moment, it's a big debate in the industry if it is milk or not. Since it doesn't really exist, there are... There's only five companies that make cell-based milk right now, none of them on the market. So there's still a lot of room to play in terms of what to call it and how to go about regulating it. Um, I think it's a work in progress. We are working closely with um, these regulatory bodies to make sure that every step of our production is um, adequate and appropriate for future regulation. So making sure that even early on, this, the um, consumables that we use, for instance, are FDA approved or else it doesn't make sense to use it and to try to optimize it later. It really doesn't work like that. Yeah, I think um, it will definitely be interesting to see and also the, the consumer's reaction to it. What are we supposed to call it? We have been doing some research with consumers to see if they are receptive to that kind of milk. And we've seen that there's a lot of anticipation for a product like this one because it will allow people to consume dairy products that fit more within their values um, for sustainability and for animal um, ethics. So I think I think it's something that we have to work on collaboratively and not just with within the business sector, not just companies thinking between companies, what well, should we call it, but also involved the public and the people who are actually going to buy these products. Right. I think especially in B2C, but if it is a cosmetic product, I'm vegan, I wouldn't really care if you call it milk or not. But if, as a, if as a consumer, I'm consuming this, then I care. Am I really consuming milk or what it is? It is better yeah. milk. So. <laughs> and you talked about safety. So in, in the biopharma, biopharma world, you have to run tests on animals to check the safety before you even do clinical trials. So in the food product, what are the safety tests? Is it just animal testing or can you just show in vitro uh, testing data? That would be enough. It's not animal testing. We don't want to in- involve any animal in our, in our technology or process whatsoever. Not, nothing that comes from an animal. Um, but in terms of safety, I think it's more on a molecular level at first. So you study the components of your milk to make sure that there are no like foreign bodies inside that could contaminate or that would cause a problem to the consumer. And then you have to run some more tests, I believe, for, for taste and nutritional profile. We're going to work with um, another company that will that is used to do all of these testing for the um, regulatory bodies so they have all of the expertise required to make sure that their product is safe for consumption got it so it's more the profiling of the product rather than exactly there's no way cat that drink the milk to see if it's good (laughs) nothing like that yeah no, cats can consume it when it is uh, approved by <laughs> fda but yeah yeah that's really uh, interesting i will come back to the business model now so you talked about more b2b producing them as one of the ingredients because there's a huge demand to have animal free product in cosmetic they already banned animal testing in mo- many of the countries europe banned it first now i hear the news different countries are banning it mexico recently banned it so, so there's a huge pressure for cosmetic product to go completely animal free, not just in terms of uh, testing. So, so what what are the different business model you are leveraging? Are you leveraging in the long term more B two C, or are you also thinking about creating your own product? Because I was looking at one animal free milk producer. They highlight different products like ice cream, cheese coming from their product. So what are your thoughts about it? Yes. The first thing that we want to approach when we do go to market after getting the approval is um, B2B, yes, but inside of food products. I think, as you said, there's more and more demand for these um, non-animal-based products. And um, especially like in, in the dairy world for cheese, for instance, 
many people that are vegetarian and that want to switch to a vegan diet but won't say that it's because they don't want to quit cheese. So by partnering with cheese company or dairy companies that have cheese in their product line, we can go into market um, as um, an ingredient that collaborates with that specific product. And over the time, once people recognize um, Better Milk as an ingredient company and see it on um, all of their favorite products and start to know who we are and what our values are and what our goal is, we, we eventually want to make our own B2B, uh, B2C um, product line. So our, really, our vision is to have the entirety of the dairy products from cream to cheese to cream cheese to everything that has dairy in it we would want to have it. Uh, we would really want to become a standard in terms of um, alternative dairy that is similar as traditional milk. Very cool. And do you plan to offer it as a technology, as a service, or you plan to biomanufacturing yourself at scale? Um, that's a really good question. I think there are some parts that we would like to license, especially before we get to market, because it is a very expensive company to run. There's a lot of R&D that is required for getting to the market. So I think we'll probably license some of our technology if it is uh, bioreactors or cell lines or even some improved medium for cells. That's definitely in our business model. Yes. And we have patents for that are coming for the licensing. Love it. So if you have to think about like... Like 2030 or 2035 or 40, what will happen if we go to any a big store? Uh, will we see a different shelf dedicated to alternative milk? Or we will still have plant-based milk and cell-based uh, milk and the real world milk. I don't know what to call them now. <laughs> so like, where do you see this industry is going? Like, do you see all of them will coexist? Or you think we will ultimately replace uh, a cow uh, producing milk? I think they will coexist for a while. As alternative milks go, the, the more the better. Uh, if it's precision fermentation or if it's cellular or if it's plant-based, I completely support it. I think that as the year go by and there are more and more companies introducing alternative dairy products in the market, we're going to slowly reduce traditional markets share. And maybe in 60, 50 70 years, we'll see a decline of the dairy industry and the dairy industry hopefully will partner with alternative dairy to continue delivering dairy products to consumers. I think that eventually we'll all have to understand that this traditional industry is not sustainable and that we have no choice but to find better technologies that help have the same products that are currently on the market, but without all of the nefast consequences. So yeah, I, I'm prone collaboration for now. And then hopefully in the years to come, we'll change the status quo to alternative dairy. That might not be called alternative dairy anymore. It might be dairy. <laughs> yeah, it will be dairy. It takes time for the transition. And yes, I, definitely. I wanted to understand like what is the impact of your local region? First of all, if you don't mind telling where are you based and what is the impact of local support system in that region? Yes, we are based in Montreal in Canada. And the, in terms of support there, we have received a lot of support from accelerators here in the space. Uh, we are incubated at District 3 in Montreal based at Concordia University. And they have offered us lab space, which is crucial for technology. Without lab space, we, we could not run. And there's a lot of different grants options also in Canada that are really supportive of startups especially in the life science and biotech world, which has been really supportive and really great. In terms of the dairy industry, as you may know, <laughs> Canadian industry is really big. In Quebec, we have posters everywhere for milk. So of course, it will definitely be a challenge to try to compete with that dairy industry. And this is why at first, we don't want them to see us as our competitors. We want right. to try to work something together to develop something that they might need. For instance, a milk without lactose, which is harder to produce with downstream processing, could be done with our technology. And we have seen positive responses from dairy companies here in Canada who have spoken with us about our technology and about our plan. 
and are getting more and more receptive to the idea that this kind of technology will exist soon. I think they have been thinking and apprehending that this technology um, is coming for quite a while now with the plant-based industry. They probably figured out that sometime it's gonna move on to something that right. is more ma milk-like. Right. So I think it's just a matter of approaching it the right way and try to collaborate without pushing anyone on the streets. That is really not our goal. Yeah, I think these bigger companies, it's just probably a smarter thing for them to diversify their portfolio, right? Yeah, yeah. we had cows, great. But now you have other sources to produce uh, milk in the long term, maybe with a better nutritional value and uh, maybe more cost effective in the near term. Cool. I think I have uh, learned so many new things. I was excited before talking to you. I'm more excited now just to <laughs> thinking about the, the potential of uh, what you are working on. Any final words for hiring bio entrepreneurs? I think just don't be scared to learn and to um, learn things that are outside of your comfort zone. That was something that was really big for me. Um, I had a psychology background and at first I felt the imposter syndrome 100% to run a biotech company. But as I mentioned earlier, we are not born knowing everything. So if you want to learn something, go for it. And don't be afraid of the, the judgment or the, the big eyes when people look at you and and when you say that you run a biotech company as a psych major, um, dream big and believe in your dreams is, I would be my final word. Love it. I think biotech uh, belongs to everyone. We, we need more yeah. people in the mainstream, more people curing cancer, irrespective of their background, their location, resources they have access to. So we need to bring more people to the mainstream to help us uh, make this uh, world uh, better, stronger, more ethical, more sustainable. Exactly. Anyone can do it. And persistence is key when you're in that industry. So don't give up okay. and follow your dreams. Jennifer, it is really inspiring what you're doing. And I Thank really you. appreciate your time today. And I will talk to you soon. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you for having me. Have a great Bye. day. You too. Bye.